I'm going to get into prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for this awesome day that you have given us, Jesus. I'm asking God that you may breathe life into your word at this moment so that your people may understand and see what you are trying to tell them, God. For your word is active. It's alive. It's breathing from your breath, Jesus, Lord. Make it come alive inside of us, Jesus. I ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. I thank you guys for joining me again. If you guys have not seen um, my part one or part two videos, please, I encourage you to go see them before seeing this one because I probably won't make sense to you. We are in the life of Joseph and I am starting from Genesis 40, but I'll just give you like a little rundown of what's going on and what we're trying to do here. Um, we're trying to, um, I believe, establish and 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 acknowledge the fact that God wants us to become true worshipers. He wants us to understand and know what his meaning of what true worship is. We majority of the time think that true worship is praising and thank, thanking God, but that's part of it. That is part of it. And because there's a verse that says that, you know, let hymns and songs come out of um, our hearts towards the Lord and stuff like that. And that's, and that's just, just part, part of, of what God, God wants us to do, because that's, that's part of our walk, walk, being thankful, praising him and loving him through our thanksgiving. thanksgiving. But, but what, what true worship and I believe what true worship is, is not just that. It's it's actually being able to acknowledge God that he is present with you in your daily walk with him, whether that's doing the dishes, whether that's cleaning the baby's butt, his pam changing his pamper, um, whether that's. Um, doing life in general work because he wants us to learn how to live from the inside out and that's in that part two series that I have of the true worshiper and I think you guys would really enjoy that so yeah go ahead and just see, see it when you guys have a chance um, but I just want to give you guys an update of Joseph's life because that's where we're at right now we're trying to see how God redeems or the redemption of Joseph and where oh um, uh, starting with the beginning of Joseph, he was 17 years old. He's living under the authority of his parents. He um, he has brothers and sisters. He loves, um, I don't think sisters, but he had 11 brothers at the time. Benjamin wasn't born yet until later on. Um, but to this, to this story, he seemed to um, want to please his brothers by telling him two dreams he had, especially his father, his daughter's figure, and he was just like, how is this? You can be bigger, like higher in position than me. I don't think so. You know, one was with the um, the the haystack bowing down with bowing down that was surrounding him, and it was bowing down to him. And then he told that to his brothers. They became envious, and they they started plotting to how to get rid of him and all that stuff. But I think he did it with the motive of trying to people please, trying to please them. And sometimes when we're trying to please people. And trying, and trying to, to um, help, help them, them see what, what, what only God has for you. Asked for you. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes they start envying and wanting to start getting rid of you or look at you down and look at you in a, in a way that, you know, is very displeasing. So anyways, he ended up telling his father the, the second dream, which was the stars and the moons bowing down to him. And, you know, Joseph had these two big dreams. And it, it's funny because it ended up being where his brother's sold him into slavery and he's probably here thinking this does not look like the dream that i had this is, does not look like the dreams that i had and if we can get go further in this is in 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 the part two series where it talks about where he was in submission of potiphar he was the master he was leading in his home in Potiphar's home, and he was organized. He was very an organized person because obviously he was doing the task that God um, ordained him to do at that moment. And even though he didn't understand why things were happening, he still trusted God with what he had. And I'm not sure if I talked about this last week, but I I was think I talked about setting a schedule where where God wants us to be able to set a schedule with Him, give Him our plans before Him, and and let him um, see what needs to be adjusted. And, and throughout that, throughout that persevering in through the schedule that he um, gives us and he helps us with, um, 
He helps, he helps us to understand how to persevere, even if we don't feel like doing certain things in that schedule that we've already set for our lives, because we have big dreams, big goals in our lives, whether that's to be a better wife, a better mother, a better um, husband, a better, better anything, a, a person that works um, as a, as a, as your own boss, you know what I mean? And, um, but God wants us to know the different roles. He wants us to be able to know how to schedule ourselves around people and how to, and if you're a boss, obviously, um, on, and you're, you're, you're on your own, you obviously have a pastor, you know, he wants us to learn how to be able to, um, submit and respect our pastors as well and stuff like that. And a lot of people gossip and, and all that stuff. But today, let me just go ahead and get into it. So, I left off at the end of um, chapter 39, where, you know, we see that Potiphar's wife ended up trying to tempt um, Joseph and trying to get her to do her, you know, their way of doing things, you know, the worldly way of doing things. And since Joseph was such a faithful man and he was such a God-fearing man, he was thrown into prison for that. And even in, it, I mean, we see in the context where the master got mad because he believed his wife, obviously, who wouldn't believe their wives, you know what I mean? Um, and, and got angry and threw him into prison. And of course, we talk about that in part two, the wayward woman, where Proverbs talk about the wayward woman, that, that woman that tries to get us to do or go back to how we used to be in our flesh. Like whether that's just giving up and throwing ourselves under the covers and saying, God, I can't do this anymore. God wants to do God little by little. He works in us to get us to a place to understand his love, his mercy, our identity in him. And when, when those things are established, his love, his mercy, our identity, thanksgiving, when those things are established first in your heart, we are able to now propel into what God wants us to do, which is to learn how to treat others, um, learn the different roles of how, how you say in, in, in our married lives or whether that be you having a boss or you being a, a boss and how to treat the people that are around you um, and so forth. So this series is mostly about how or the way you treat others. Our attitudes are is what reflects, you know, what I talked about last week where I think it was the first part of the second part, but anyways, where it talked about where David um, was the shepherd and, um, and and he sent his prophet Samuel to Jesse's house and, Je and, um, and Jesse had sons and he was displayed before Samuel. Samuel was like, oh, these must be the kings because they look so good from the outside. But the Lord told him that I do not see or I don't, I don't, yeah, yeah, I don't I see, see what man sees. sees. I, I see, see what's, what's inside the heart. heart. And, that's and that's what I want to get deeper into today. The, the fact that God sees what's going on inside the heart and the matters of the heart. Because the thing about here is how God deals with the matter of the heart and what he's trying to display in this context of the story. How Joseph was an honorable, honorable man. He was a respectful man. He he, sub, he was able to submit himself to different types of authorities. He knew the order in which God had um, roles, um, or, yeah, role models in his life. He knew how to submit to them and how to learn how to, to balance that with respect and submission. Because obviously we can come to a point in our walk with God with, when we're only submitting to man, but we're never submitting to God. And there is a balance there. And God wants us to learn how to do that today. At the end of chapter 39, we see that Joseph goes through the same cycle again. But this time he was he was thrown into prison. He was given two assignments. He was given two people as as an assignment. And you know, we see in the in in the first where he was just um putting things in order in Potiphar's house. But if we see in this story, story um, with the cupbearer and the baker, we see that now Joseph was given two people to take care of. And even though he was given these two, I mean, so meaning that he had someone over him 
and then, and then he, he had, had people had below him, him not meaning not that, that they're they're they're, they're below below like, like saying that they're, they're dirty or whatever, whatever but he had people that he was he was in charge to of to take care of and so let's just get in the story because i'm really excited to get up trying to take care of whatever god gave him it was, was you, you know, know he was, was given, given a, a more of a responsibility. So regardless of him being thrown into prison, and he felt sometimes we feel like we're being thrown into prison um, um, mentally, emotionally, and physically sometimes. And is that when Joseph found himself being thrown into prison, without him realizing, he was actually being promoted. He was actually being promoted spiritually because the the deeper we walk with God. The, the deeper or the, or the depth, depth of our hearts heart come forward. And, and God, God wants to demonstrate how we should take care of one another in our surroundings. surroundings. Because, because even though, though these people were, were not believable, these, these people were not believers of God, he was, he was still, still able to show them and demonstrate by his character and his ways that things or how do you say dreams or giftings or or the matters of the heart or Whatever it is that Joseph had, his faithfulness, his character only came from the spirit, only came from God and his word. So let's just get into it. The cupbearer and the baker. Sometime later, the cup was angry with these two officials and chief, chief cupbearer and chief baker and put them into custody in the home of the captain of the guard. In the same prison were Joseph where Joseph was confined, the captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, and he attended them. After they had begun, been in custody for some time, each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were being held in prison, had a dream the same night, and each of them, each of them had its own meaning. When Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. So I want to talk about that really fast. Dejected actually means depressed. You've ever had someone in your life around you that they just look dejected. They look so down. They look so depressed. I remember going, um, was it? I think it was on Sunday. I went to go pick up my daughters from my mom's house. And my, my grandmother was looking so down. She was looking so down. And sometimes when we don't have an eye to see through God's mirror like, like um vision, vision perspective, perspective we, could we could just look, look at people that are dejected and just walk walk, walk right past, past them and, and not really not care. care that's, that's how, how that's, that's how cold this world is we we can become so um hard-hearted we can be so um broken inside that we're not able to see our surroundings and how important it is for to god to god that when we see people that are down these are called the poor in spirit when we're not able to see them. And but we're gonna talk about how Joseph encouraged these these guys. They were down and dejected. And he went ahead and he said, he asked them, why do you look so sad today? He was bold enough to say, why do you look so sad? And sometimes we feel like, we feel like we're, we're kind of afraid to ask people those questions because we're just like, they're like, like um, because life hit me, you know what I mean? Like, you know, you know and, and it makes us feel like, you know, awkward, but, but it's so important for God. God wants us to show mercy. mercy. He wants he us to show mercy and over sacrifice. And sometimes we feel like we're sacrificing more or we view the sacrificing more over mercy. I talked about that last, last time, I, last week in part two, where we have a tendency of wanting to, instead of listen, with our eyes and our hearts and our ears to another person or sit down with them, we choose to want to just do with them, do do something for them, do something for them. But God doesn't ask for sacrifice. God wants us to be able to uplift each other and to encourage each other and to know what each other needs. And the only one that can really show us to do that or lead us into that, into that glory is God, the spirit, Jesus himself. He, by, by showing, showing us through this context. So, so they, they said, said, we both have dreams, but, but there is no, no one to interpret, interpret them. them. Then, then Joseph, Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God. Tell, Tell me your dream. dream. 
So the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dream. He said to them, in my dream, I saw a vine in front of me, and on the vine were three branches as soon as it budded its blossom and it clustered ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took grapes, squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and put them in the cup in his hand. This is what it means. Joseph said to him, you know what I liked about this before I continue that part, because it just really stunned me. I didn't really want to say it, but I'm going to say it now. But when, when we have when we have dreams and we have visions, we have to be able to know that where it comes from. And Joseph was so honest to them. He was so honest to them, bold enough to say that don't do not interpretations belong to God. And I believe that's one once that's another step that that another thing that um, Joseph had the fact that he was able to realize that whatever he had. It was God that gave it to him. You know, there's a scripture that says um, that God gives us all we need according to his riches and his glory. I think that's in, um, I think that's in Hebrew. I'll give you guys that, that scripture later on. I'll put it down on, on the thing there. But it's a really good scripture. And, and it helps us to understand that all things, all things, whether emotional, emptiness, whether things that make us feel like we're drowning, um, he is able to lift us up. The, all, all things, I'm telling you all things. When he talks about all things, he's talking about things like pertaining to the word of God. Peace, joy, love, patience, all of these things. Materialistic things, they're, yeah, they're what we need, but God can supply those things. God can give us those. And that's actually in Matthew 6, if you guys ever want to read that. But, okay, okay so, so let me continue because I, it's getting good. This, this is what it means, Joseph said. I don't know if I... Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes, squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and put them in his hands. This is what it means, Joseph said to him. The three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh would lift your head up and restore your position. Look how encouraging that is. That sounds so encouraging. And you will... Put Pharaoh's cup in his hand, just as you used to do when you were his cupbearer. But when all, all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of the prison. It's amazing. It was just amazing. So number one thing that, that, that Joseph did was he encouraged him. He encouraged um. The cup bear, or the, my story. So as I was um, at my mom's house and I saw my grandmother in this position of being dejected and depressed, the words of God just started flowing out of me. And that's how I knew, like, that's how Jesus is with me. That's how it makes, it made me feel that way at that moment as I was breathing life into her, not me, but Jesus, the Holy Spirit, was breathing life and encouraging her. And I could have just walked off. I could have just let her be like that. But something in me, or the Holy Spirit was telling me to go to her. I helped her fix some blinds that she had. Because she, she, I, I thought maybe, okay, maybe the blinds were the problem. Um, because they were being fixed or whatnot. But she just looked so down. And when I sat next to her and I, and I said, hi, and I hugged her, she felt so up, like as if she knew. I saw in her eyes, like as if she knew she was ready to receive something from me. And, and it, made me, it made me realize that, made me feel like I do carry a treasure. I do have a treasure within me. We all have a treasure within us that we carry, that it's up to us whether we release it or we relinquish it and let it flow through us. And at that moment, I chose to let it flow. Um, I, I encouraged her because obviously, as I was doing this Bible study to, uh, last week, and I was trying to get this all together, it was, this was one thing that I had just learned of not to, um, whenever I saw someone that was down or sat, sat or out, to be able to uplift them and encourage them and let them know who they were. 
because sometimes the enemy attacks and we go through seasons and we go around these cycles where we feel like giving up. We feel like not going forward with God. And I found myself like that yesterday where I felt like I couldn't do this anymore. And I, I, I just didn't want to do think certain things in my life anymore. And I felt like, you know, and the thing is that the enemy comes up against our minds. It makes us feel like we can't, we can't. And it happens. It just happens to certain people. But as I was sitting there and I was uplifting her, um, it just made, it made me realize that that's how Jesus is towards me. When I found myself in that um, position yesterday, the word says that the Holy Spirit is our comforter. He is the one that he teaches all. He teaches us all things. That's in John 14, 25, 26, um, where the Holy Spirit, he gives us the Holy Spirit to comfort us in our times of need and to come boldly to the throne of grace to receive mercy in time or in due season. Um, those scriptures are so good to have inside of you so that when the enemy just comes up against your mind and your heart, that, that when we find ourselves cornered by lies and, and, and being down and depressed, we are able to we are able to know that the Holy Spirit inside of us can encourage us with the word, can help us be liberated by those from those lies. Because the enemy just has a tendency of just coming towards us really hard. And sometimes when we find ourselves in that position, David said, I encourage myself in the Lord. And that's one way to encourage you, yourself to remember, to remember all the things that Jesus has done for you, to remember, to bring back into remembrance. That's in um, Ecclesiastes where he talks about where this guy was totally depressed. OK, and then he comes to a point in the middle of um, chapter three of, um, of Lamentations where he talks about how I've been beguiled and I've been pressed and crushed down by the hand of God and all that stuff. Then in the middle of it, he says, but I, but I recall this. He just stops and he just stops all this pity, depressing stuff. And he just says, but I do recall this, the mercies of God. He recalled it and it was good for a man to carry the burdens of his youth and all that stuff. It's a very good context. I really love that. I really do love that. Just everything that I had here in my messages is just going somewhere else. And I think this is truly for you guys. This is awesome because I had some other things in my message and now it's just going somewhere else. And I think I'm trying to just make it small because I know my little babies are by themselves over there. So I need, I need to be quickly. So anyways, within three days, Pharaohs would lift up your head and will restore you to your position, and you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand, just as you used to do when you were his cup bearer. But when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh. Obviously, we know that you totally forgot later on. We'll see that. And get me out of this prison. I was forcefully carried off the land of Hebrews. And, and even, even here, here, I have I done, done nothing to deserve to being put in the, in this dungeon. You ever feel, feel like, like we've, we've, we've um, we, we, we feel, feel like that? that? You know, sometimes, sometimes we feel, feel like we have not deserved to be put, put in a position that we're in. And, um, but sometimes it's just God trying to mold us. Sometimes it's in the dark, you know. Um, I remember, I remember telling this to my sister one time. I heard this from, I think, Kristen Kane or something, where she put up, like, a camera, and she said that, so, so, like, we live in an instant world, you know, instant gratification, instant pleasure, where everything is just fast, fast, fast. We need there now. We, obviously, we have prime now, where everything is prime now, and everything is just coming to us now in such a fast pace. And with God, it's not like that. With, with God, God is that, that we, we find, find ourselves like, like where Joseph is, is. We're in, in the, the dark world. world. You see, see as, as you know, know back, back in my day, day, you know, I don't know who's who's, who's born after, after that, that, but um, I remember, I remember the, cameras the cameras being these little cameras, cameras where you would deject or eject the the, the little film, film, and you would have to go to war rooms and leave it there. Now the thing is that some of us don't know that back. In those, in those days, days where they used to have, have the film, film they, they would have, have to put, put that, that film, film through a process. process. And this, this process, process was 
that they had to carry this film, put it into a what we call a dark room. They would have to stay in this dark room until the process. Now, if any light, like let's say if they were to open the door or anything like that, if any light were to hit this film that they were trying to process in this um, water thing above, um, it would be damaged. And majority of the times, it's like that with us. God wants to take us through a process. He wants to enable us. He wants to um, stir us. He wants to be able to carry us through situations and be able to carry on through or persevere through these situations. If we're not able to be faithful or carry on or persevere through these little situations where he was at, you know, in this prison or this dark room, then we are not able to handle the light. We aren't able to handle more what's out there. So as we're going through this process of the dark room, God helps us to see and realize the things that need to be, how you say, shifted in our minds or or let go of. And so the majority of times things need to be let go of. And we have to be willing to say enough is enough. We need to be willing to say, that's it. I don't want to live this way anymore. And just say, and just run to God. Sometimes running to God is kind of hard. Go over there. I'm being interrupted by my faithful little daughter. (laughs) But anyways, this dark room process is where Joseph found himself in. And he found himself there for two full years before he was able to be exposed to um, what he had to do. And, oh, my God, that had to be a word for someone because that was not in my notes. And this is awesome. This is good. But this dark process in in this room is it's for our favor. It's in our favor. It's something that God is trying to work in us. He's trying to work things out through us, inside of us. And if we are not able to be faithful here in our homes and respect and love and cherish and see with the eyes of our heart, the people that are sad around us, be able to deal with the people that we've been assigned to here at home, then God can't really use us out there. God can't really give us more than what we can handle. Honestly, I don't know if that's a scripture. I mean, I've heard people saying that God does give us more than we can handle. Let me tell you something. I think that's true because he's given me like five kids. And sometimes I feel like I just can't handle all of it. And it's true. There are times where I just find myself just wanting to give up as a mother. I'm wanting to give up as as a teacher, as as a wife. Sometimes I find myself very hopeless in thinking that things will ever change. And sometimes it's not our surroundings that God is trying to call us to change. It's the things that are within us that need to be changed in order to see our surroundings like an eagle. Um, you guys heard of that scripture that says... Um, the weary, they will mount up like wings of eagle and all that stuff. It's a very good scripture. It's an Isaiah. I'll find it and I'll give it to you guys later. Um, but there's a fact, in fact, that an eagle actually can see a storm coming from a distance. And when an eagle sees the storm coming from a chick- from a, a distance, if you see a chicken, the chicken will hide. You know what I mean? He's got to go into shelter. But in reality, the fact is is that an eagle, what he does is that when the storm comes towards him, instead of going to find shelter, he bounces off up over the storm and he flies over the storm. And that's how God wants to get us. He doesn't want us to be like chickens. He wants us to be able to... um, he doesn't want to like have us as chickens and going to shelter and just hiding away from life. He wants us to be like eagles, being ready for whenever a storm comes, he knows. That's why he talks about putting our shield on. Ephesians 6 talks about putting our shields on, putting our arm on completely. Sometimes we have our head on, but we never have our breastplate on. We never have the, sh- the shoes of peace or the sword or the weapon and all that stuff. Sometimes we have one individually and yeah, this is a process in which we have to find ourselves learning how to put all of it on. But we have to remember and know that whenever whenever we wake up in the morning that we're going to face battles. 
And we have to be okay with that. We have to get to a point in our lives where we say, you know what? I know what's going to happen. So instead of being myself pity and being depressed and being down about it, we need to be able to be encouraged in the Lord, get up in the morning, get into prayer, seek God. He, he, he wants you. He desires you to seek him. He loves that. But we're, we're not seeking him. We run dry. We become malnutrition. And that's not where God wants us to be. So let me continue because I'm getting ahead of myself now. So it says here. So um, verse 16, when the chief baker saw that Joseph had given a favorable interpretation, sometimes people think they're going to get a favorable interpretation when they're living the way they do. But look what happens. He said to Joseph, I had a dream too. On my, on my head were three baskets of bread. In the top baskets were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh. But the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. This is what it means, Joseph said. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift, will lift off your head and impale your body on a pole and the birds will eat away from your flesh. Oh my goodness. Sometimes, sometimes this could be hard. Sometimes I find myself in a way like when people are living a certain way and they're Christian, I find myself or we find ourselves getting afraid of telling them the truth. Sometimes we find ourselves getting afraid because we avoid conflict and we don't know what healthy conflict is. And sometimes when we lack the, the knowledge of knowing what healthy conflict is, to be able to um, restore one another, because there's a scripture I'm going to be talking about in a second, but sometimes we can get so, so trapped into people pleasing that we don't realize that healthy conflict to confront them in their sin is really important. And Joseph was bold enough to be able to speak truth into this guy's life. He was bold enough to speak truth. Sometimes when you are led by the Spirit, because there is a scripture that talks about that. When we are led by the Spirit, we are able to speak truth into the lives of our loved ones, into the lives of people that are not living the right way. But it's, being a, it's allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us into all of that. I'll give you guys the scripture in a second. Okay, it says, it says here, Galatians 6, 1. Brother, if any man is overtaken in any transgression or any tra trespasses or sins, you who are spiritual should restore them such a one of spirit of gentleness. Meaning that when we are humble before God, remember, come to me who are you who are labor and heavy burden. I will give you less. Learn from me for I am am gentle and I am humble. When we are humble before God first and have him lead us into um, restoring such, such and such relationships, God wants us to be able to restore such and such relationships. How do you know there's relationships where God does not want to restore? Well, these people won't, they'll ignore you. They won't, how you say, give you any time of day. That's, that's how you would know, know if that's, that's the type of relationship God wants you to, whether that be with your, um, with one of your friends. Usually it's a friend where I remember I had a really close friend in um, Tampa and all of a sudden when she moved, we just, she just stopped. She like literally blocked me and everything. <laughs> I don't even know why. I don't even know why. We probably we did get into like a little altercation, but for me, I looked at it as healthy conflict. You know, every friend, every friend um, has to know how to how to deal with those things. Actually, I'm gonna let you guys know a little tip of how, how to deal with healthy conflict. When you are 99% right about the situation and 1% wrong, look for that 1% wrong that you did. Then, then you'll be, be able, able to go, to go in peace, peace go, go to, to the, the brethren, brethren 
and let them know, hey, I was wrong. I did this and this and this. My attitude, I needed to adjust my attitude. I'm, I said it a certain way. My my tone of voice was a little bit harsh. It was hard and all that stuff. That's how you are able to um, go in peace and be able to um, confront healthy conflict, good conflict, because we all fight. We all get into humanness you know what I mean we're all human and we get into arguments and we have disagreements but sometimes there are people in our lives that just they block us they don't like it they don't want to do it but that's that's on them and that's how you know where God has said he shut the door in that relationship and then you have people where you you do confront you say hey I did this I did that I'm sorry and all that stuff and then they are able to now say I'm sorry as well, because I did this and I did that. And they're able to know how to um, confront the conflict easily. And there's people that just lack the knowledge and they don't know. But it's it's mostly, we can't have that expectation of thinking everybody knows what we know. We can't have that expectation of thinking, well, you know, they're supposed to treat me like that. They're supposed to, yet the Bible does say that we are supposed to treat our enemies with love and with good and all that stuff. So regardless of anything, there are people in our lives like Jesus had. Jesus had Judah. He had Judah in his group. And and some majority of times, yes, we will have Judas sis in our groups where they envy us or they treat us like they're or they say certain things. But last week I did talk about um, who you are in Christ and how it's important to know and establish and deepen that root of who you are in Christ because sometimes the Judases want to control you. Sometimes we don't know how to say no to them without stirring up a conflict. And that's where I'm talking about healthy conflict and all that stuff anyways, um, how to deal with that. He spoke in courage, he spoke the truth in a courageous way, you know? And sometimes that's what God wants us to, to do. Whether it's that in our spouses, and believe me, um, Esther, she had a time. She said, "There's a um, in Mordecai. He told her there is a time to speak and a time time not to speak. And at that moment, there was a time to speak because there was a conflict. There was an issue. I don't know why I'm so stuck on that, but God only knows. Whoever needs it. But anyways, so this is what it means. Joseph said, the three days eat a bread. The birds will eat away from your flesh.' Now, verse twenty. Now the third day was Pharaoh's birthday, and he gave a feast for all his officials. He lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker and the presence of his officials. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position so that he once again put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he impaled the chief baker. Just, Just as, as Joseph, Joseph has said to them in his interpretation. The chief cupcake bearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. Somehow, we have people like that in our life too. <laughs> Where they forget us. They forget us in the dark. But it's okay because Jesus never forgets you. Never. He never forgets us. Thank you, Jesus. So I'm just going to lead us into prayer really fast and just close this with that. And if any of you guys just need encouragement, I just want to encourage you guys at this moment that any depression, any, any, if you feel dejected like these guys did in the beginning and you have, you don't have a lot of people to encourage you, I encourage you now and let you know that you can encourage yourself in the Lord. Know that God is always with you because his word says it. And when his word says it, Jesus is the truth and Jesus is the word of God. And when we are in the word, we are becoming one with him and we are becoming intimate with Jesus. Into me, you see. Jesus sees into us. And there's nothing that you can hide, nothing that you can run away from because Jesus can find you even in the in hell, like even the, the, the depths of hell, he can find you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He'll always want to be by your side. And he'll want you. He has called you into so much. He has called you into agreement with him. He'll never, he'll, oh, let me just say this again. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. 
Even when you're having a day where you're filled with so many mistakes, when the weight of sin or whatever weight, whether that is the weight of distraction, like Martha, I found myself being a Martha today. But God knows how only he can help us become more like Mary, to sit at his feet and to sit at the throne of grace, to be able to um, relinquish his love to others daily, Jesus. Jesus, thank you, God, with your Holy Spirit, Jesus, God. And as you're using me to encourage them, God, I'm asking you, God, that you may give me the words right now, God. That you may be the one to propel into their lives, to uplift them and to let them know that they are chosen. They are a holy priesthood. That they are loved by you. Be loved by you. John was one of the disciples that he absolutely knew. He absolutely was persuaded. He understood how deeply loved he was by you, Jesus. And that is what you want us to understand. That is what you want us to know about you, God. Your love and your mercy, that that may be deeply rooted in you. How wide and how high and how the length of it, God. You want us to know all of these things about you, Jesus. God. God. I don't know why you keep repeating, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, but someone needs to hear it right now. That you'll never leave them nor forsake them in the, all their sins. Micaiah 7, 7, 8. It says that when God, when you ask for forgiveness, he then takes all of your sins and he throws them to the depths of the ocean. To the, to the profound. profound. He doesn't remember them no more. He doesn't remember any of that anymore. He loves you in an everlasting life. There is a scripture that says, therefore, there is now no guilt. Oh, I love this scripture because he was giving it to me today. And that's in Romans 8, 1. Oh, my God. My favorite scripture. Where it says, so now those who are in Christ Jesus, therefore, there is now no condemnation, no guilt for those who are in Christ. For the old has passed away, that's in 1 Corinthians 5.17, where he says that, therefore, now when you have been established in Christ, the old has passed away, the old spiritual moral deadness has passed away, and behold, now the new has come. So when you repeatedly say to yourself, you are a new creation, believe, believe in his word, because his word is true. You are a new creation. I thank you, Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I thank you over and over again, Jesus. I believe you are and will come, Jesus. All right, guys. Thank you, guys. I'm going to close with this. Bye, guys. Love you. Bye.